Welcome back everyone to Peeling Subaru. This will be episode 34. Um, we're getting close to the end here of Mr. Barrett's song discussions and uh, in a way maybe we're saving the best ones for last so this episode may take a while. This song Wolfpack was released in 1970 on the Barrett album and in my opinion it is Mr. Barrett's best song as a whole. I won't say that it's his most interesting song. I won't say that I feel that it's my favorite song. It is one of my favorite songs, but uh, it is not my favorite song. And just as kind of a forewarning, this song and this discussion are going to be discussing some, I guess you could say, some fairly depressing and distressing things for some folks. So uh, I'm going to try and discuss those head on and I'm going to try and provide a backdrop of positivity regarding those topics and end kind of with a positive note. But the material itself uh, may be distressing to some people. So if, um, if you want to have your own interpretation of the song Wolfpack, now this song very much like Effervescing Elephant, I gave a warning for Effervescing Elephant that that song may not be what people think it means, and in a way, perhaps Wolfpack may be similar. I don't know. Of course, it's difficult to understand often what Mr. Barrett is relaying, but this song may be tackling some some difficult things in Mr. Barrett's life, so uh, perhaps that's positive in, it, in and of itself, that he was willing to tackle those things and turn them into something that was useful or perhaps... Uh, remindful to him, remindful to himself of who he was and where he came from. But uh, that may be happening in this song. So just as a warning, a heads up, I guess you could say that uh, this this discussion is going to be pretty deep, and uh, and some folks aren't into that. So if if you're the kind of person that's disturbed by that, then I'll suggest that you just watch some of the other videos. So let's start off with our introductions, news, and notes. Uh, first off is we have some more new subscribers, and thank you very much for doing that. Uh, uh, I don't know how much more of these will do. I guess maybe like five more. <laughs> it's kind of funny to think that uh, I'm nearly done running through all of his, uh, his songs, and people are still kind of jumping in and whatnot. I do appreciate that people kind of jump in, and uh, if you have comments that you want to make, or thoughts that you want to provide and people do do so from time to time I welcome you in doing that please feel free to do so so the first note and correction I suppose I want to point to is uh, our previous episode we discussed the octopus and the and the previous title of it was uh, clowns and jugglers and renewed poet made a note that of course that line may very well be a nod to another one of Bob Dylan's songs, which is um, like a Rolling Stone. So uh, that that nod to like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan and the song Bob Dylan Blues, as well as the possible relation of other Barrett ly lyrics to Bob Dylan, uh, are indicators at least that he is someone who is influential in Mr. Barrett's work for whatever reason. And um, if you're familiar enough with Mr. Bob Dylan's work, then uh, Mr. Dylan's work, then I, su I suspect you'll make that connection as well. Another band that may surprise you is uh, Velvet Underground. And there are aspects of Velvet Underground that, uh, and I've noted this before, but I'll just repeat that if you, if you really like Sid Barrett and you really like Pink Floyd, you may also like Velvet Underground. If you haven't checked them out, you can. Get, may perhaps get like a best hits album or something and uh, you may find that you really enjoy their music just as an aside now another note that I would like to provide is that I was watching a, a um, YouTube video a collection of videos that are posted by Emmanuel Acho and he was discussing with Lil Wayne uh, the nature of his background and I'll give a I'll, I'll give a link to that discussion in my description and basically Lil Wayne was was discussing a bit of his personal history and also one of the questions that he was asked was what 
was one of the most distressing things that happened to him after he kind of broke through and became an artist that was recognized. And he specifically says that the thing that disturbed him the most was that people weren't letting him make the record that he wanted to make. The company wasn't going to let him do that. And so uh, at that time, he thought he was just going to quit. He was going to opt out and he was done and he wasn't going to continue anymore with making music. So that that aspect of someone like Lil Wayne, and you can you can watch the video. I think the whole interview and the whole discussion between them is is a very interesting discussion. And I think also that Emmanuel Acho does a good job of interviewing people in general. And he covers a lot of very important and difficult topics, including uh, racial relations within the United States, which are and have been strained for quite some time. So um, it's just words to a large degree, but I think it's also worth watching and I enjoy watching it. So you may enjoy watching it as well. But at any rate, the, the entire Lil Wayne interview is interesting to me. And in particular, when he discusses that aspect of why he was willing to walk away from the music industry because he was being limited by companies. Very interesting little note. Now, another thing that I would kind of like to point out is there is an actual interview where Mr. Barrett is discussing all the latest uh, hits or the latest songs to come out. And this is towards the end of his career with Pink Floyd. And I'll provide a link in the description uh, as well if you want to check that out. But basically, he's being interviewed and they're running ideas past him for songs and asking him if he knows that. Can he recognize this single does he know who the singer is? Does he know what it's about, etc.? And you can tell that he's really messing with this interviewer. And I, I can't recall exactly what the interviewer's name is. At any rate, there are two points in time during that interview where Mr. Burt, uh, he makes a reference to the idea of playing a song faster or slower. And of course, this is something people used to do. I used to do it when I was a little kid. You could change the speed of the record playing and hear it in, in uh, I can't remember what the numbers were, but uh, in different, in speeded up time or slowed down time. And that distortion of time is, of course, consistent with uh, a number of Mr. Barrett's songs. We've discussed the idea of sending a clock through a washing machine. And of course, we've also discussed in the, in the latest Did Sid Dark Side of Oz miniseries, you can check that out if you haven't already, I'd suggest episodes one and three if you just want the basics of it. But that song, time, the, the idea of distortion of time, the importance of time, uh, that's all wound up quite often within Mr. Barrett's uh, mind for some reason. And of course, uh, we also noted the, the possible use of, or at least the knowledge of manipulation of time in a song like uh, Domino's, and and also in uh, fitting an album to uh, a soundtrack like or a movie a film like uh, Wizard of Oz. Now I've seen some other stuff since then and I, I just want to mention this really quickly I'm sorry I'm kind of going off topic a little bit but uh, apparently some people have taken other Pink Floyd songs and fitted them to things like 2001 Space Odyssey and uh, and you can get a frame or scene changes lined up very well with um, with certain songs. And I just want to mention here, now again, we discussed that as a very shallow review because it's only dealing with time. And it's not dealing necessarily with content or with things that are happening. And when you have a film that is being shot from scene to scene in accordance with time or timing, Perhaps it has a backing track or it has music in the background, especially when it's a silent film and it's mostly silent, it will keep time quite often. It would be very easy to have a song that's say perhaps 4-4 four, four time or 3-4 time and that matches what the film was filmed to and you just connect those two and then you say, oh, well, there you go. See, there's another one. There's another uh, indicator that you can just do this with whatever. Again, that's very, very um, very shallow review, in my opinion, of matching. So uh, I guess that's pretty much it for intro. I, I won't get into too much of those other ideas. That's the basic ideas that I wanted to kind of run through. 
Let's take a look then at the song Wolfpack, which, as I said, is one of my, uh, what, I, what I would consider to be his best song. And the reason for that, I'll state before you listen to it. Now, I'll give a link to a video that hopefully has the lyrics, or you can just pull the lyrics up on your phone. I, I do kind of suggest that you listen to the song on its own before you actually check out the lyrics or continue. So uh, I do suggest you go check it out. I'll give a link with the lyrics, or you can just watch a video, check it out, and then come back, and, and then I'm going to discuss the lyrics with you. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to check out Wolfpack by Mr. Barrett, and I'll explain now why I think it's his best song. <clears throat> Basically, uh, there are all of these different components to a song, and you're dealing not only with timing and lyrics and music, musicality, but also voice. And I just want to point out that all of those things are in tune in this song. There is... Um, an aspect of rhythm to this song that is frantic. It has a, a very uh, off-kilter, frantic form of rhythm to it. Uh, the lyrics themselves are dark, misty, gray, uh, confused, and you would have to say almost uh, fearful. And his voice conveys those emotions extremely well. So, uh, Mr. Bird, of course, has a uni unique voice. Everyone has a unique voice. You'd be surprised how many people can sing, uh, provided they find what type of voice fits them well. So, uh, you have, you have uh, certain singers. Um, geez, I can't remember her name right now, but uh, the, the singer that does uh, Fade Into You. And... I would say um, Hope Sandoval, that's her name, sorry. Hope Sandoval, who has a very, I don't want to say limited voice, but she limits her voice. And she conveys emotion extremely well within a certain range. And it also has kind of a dreamlike quality. It's very Barrett-like in that aspect, in, in my opinion. So she has a limited range. I would never compare her to someone like Whitney Houston, who has a very acrobatic voice, almost like... Uh, uh, Robert Plant, she's able to go all over the place and do a lot of things with her voice, but uh, Mr. Barrett in this song shows that he is capable of delivering uh, a certain emotional, uh, I guess you could say, uncertainty. And it matches the feel of the song very, very well which you would expect for someone that is writing a song to be able to tune in to the original tuning or intent of the lyrics and the timing, which is off time. You'll notice quite often that uh, the, the lyrics of the song and the verses just kind of continue to go on until they abruptly stop. So it's it's the lyrics are not formed to any kind of what you would call traditional uh, verse structure or or line structure and it's a little bit funny to me that when I remember when uh, which is going to of course show my age but uh, early rap music uh, a lot of rock musicians were like rap music it was is great because you don't have to follow this verse chorus verse chorus structure you have a lot more freedom within uh, rap music to deliver a, a variable rhythm a varied rhythm and a lot of people didn't like it, and I don't know, there was a whole discussion about all of that, and I, I don't really want to get into that because it's an inane discussion to me. But the point is that you have here a rock song like Wolfpack that has a wonderful, extremely strange sense of rhythm to it that fits the content of the material and fits Mr. Barrett's voice very, very well. And so for all of these reasons, including the just spooky nature of the music and the guitar, uh, it, is a, it is a great song. It also shows in many ways his uh, variability. Uh, he's done very slow love songs, uh, painful, pained love songs. He's done funny songs, you know, Lucky Go Happy. And here is a song that is ghostly spectral in content. It is uh, fearful and fear-inducing in many ways, and relays a certain 
I guess you could say, uh, uncertainty about the past and the future. And we'll get into that here as we run through the lyrics. So without any more talk, I've talked quite a bit. Let's look at the lyrics and consider what may be relayed here uh, about Mr. Burrett or what he may be trying to relay. The first line is that there's howling and a pack that's in formation appears. Now, I just want to point out, of course, that the in formation is uh, possibly in a formation, but also in formation. <laughs> I, I do kind of wonder if that isn't relaying something a little bit later on, and we'll see why. Of course, packs do run in a kind of formation, so that does somewhat kind of uh, make things clear. Now, he's directly appearing, appealing to our sense of sight. There is a pack that is howling, and it's approaching in formation. What kind of pack? Well, of course, it's a wolf pack, so it may be wolves, and uh, I'll discuss wolves really quickly. Now, a wolf is a very complex symbol. Now, there are two reasons why I want to discuss wolves, of course. There's a wolf pack here, which could be a representation of uh, the wolf pack scouts, which is part of Mr. Baird's history. I'll discuss that in a moment. It also could be discussing the nature of wolves themselves, and it could, of course, be doing both at the same time. We've uh, mentioned before that Mr. Barrett likes to play around with multiple things, sometimes three things all at the same time. So what is the importance of the wolf? Well, a wolf is, of course, uh, dependent upon who is seeing what the wolf represents. So this is from my J.E. Sirlo Dictionary of Symbols. Uh, Sirlo relays that the wolf is a symbol of valor among Romans and Egyptians. Isn't that interesting? Uh, it's in quite a few monuments and that uh, in Nordic mythology or, or German mythology, there's a monstrous wolf which is uh, called Fenris and he will destroy, uh, eventually be released. He's been shackled, of course. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story of Fenris the wolf. Essentially, it was a wolf cub that I believe was taken in by the gods and would eat everything and would constantly eat and grew and grew and grew and eventually the gods grew fearful of the wolf because it just kept getting stronger and eventually they knew they couldn't control it and it just kept eating more and more so they decided they would have to shackle it and uh, there's a story about how I believe Tyr had to place his hand in the mouth of Fenris to trick him into allowing them to chain him and this was like the third time they attempted to chain him and uh, finally, they had magical chains or something that held the, the wolf so that he couldn't uh, run free anymore. Now, in the uh, Nordic myth, of course, uh, eventually there's an end of time. And uh, at that point in time, then the wolf will exit um, or escape his shackles and uh, would devour the sun. So... Uh, a little bit uh, depressing in this way. Of course, the wolf here represents chaotic forces, uh, the idea of, of life consuming everything, or perhaps just a chaotic and uh, destructive force in general. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, there's also a mention that Nordic mythology is stating that cosmic order is possible only through the shackling of chaotic and destructive potential in the universe. In other words, that the nature of strength and order comes from shackling the things that are very primordial and destructive, potentially. And eventually, even though you may use those things and shackle them, eventually they will triumph in the end. They'll break free and destroy everything. Uh, the myth is apparently also connected with concepts of a final, final annihilation of the world by water or by fire, uh, which are traditionally the two most common ways that the world is destroyed, as opposed to wind and earthquake and other. There are stories of wind and earthquake. So uh, let's consider that just for a minute. Um, the importance of the wolf, of course, we've discussed this already in our discussion on Did Sid Barrett Dark Side of Oz, that Dorothy has a wolf with her. She has a domestic wolf. It's a dog. And here, again, is a reference to a dog or a wild dog, <laughs> a wolf. And, um, of course, a wild dog wouldn't simply be a wolf. It would just be a wild dog. But I think you know what I mean. It's a, it's a, an, 
an untamed creature. So uh, let's just kind of make note of the aspects of wolves. And uh, of course, uh, in Roman myth, Romulus and Remus, I believe, were, were nurtured as babes by a wolf. And there's a reason why the Romans, of course, who were a very militant people, would recognize the importance of wolves, not just in that they are extremely loyal and family-oriented, but also brave, and uh, a source of, I guess you could say, military kind of uh, endeavors. So, anyway... Uh, that's a lot of information about Wolf. So the other thing to mention about Wolf Pack is, of course, that uh, Mr. Barrett was apparently in a Wolf Pack. And Mr. Rob Chapman, in his book, A Very Regular Head, notes this. On page five, he mentions specifically that, um, that Mr. Barrett, uh, his father and his mother did collaborate uh, running a Wolf Cub Pack. And, of course, uh, that, um, that both of his parents were Quakers, and we've mentioned that before as well. So, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a form of uh, Christian background, and also a tradition within the family of running a, a wolf pack club. I don't know exactly what they are called there, but at any rate, let's move on to the next line. That was a lot of information for just one line. We will have to determine what the intents are of those references through the rest of the song. The next line starts with diamonds and clubs. What could that possibly mean? Uh, I don't really know, of course. Uh, the entire line includes diamonds, clubs, light misted fog. Of course, we've had references to light misted fog before. And uh, I believe flaming. Uh, I, I can see you, you can't see me, etc. So, and then a mention of the dead. Okay, so there specifically is a mention of the dead, which is being associated with light misted fog and the dead. Why that's being connected, I don't entirely know. Uh, though, of course, you could say that uh, memory itself is a light misted fog. So this could be a memory of uh, a memory of the dead, and we'll perhaps see why later. Now, why diamonds and clubs? I don't entirely know why diamonds and clubs would be referenced here. Uh, perhaps uh, diamonds and clubs is a reference to uh, a tarot deck. Of course, there are uh, diamonds and clubs of a sort. There are clubs, swords, coins, and um, cups. So, uh, I, for, I don't know why I forgot cups there, but I did. So, which ones of those could be referenced here? I don't entirely know. Of course, there aren't diamonds in the old tarot deck. That's a new kind of a, a deck change. And I will just point out that in a poker deck, a four-color deck, that those are tied with the color blue and green. Does that mean anything? I don't know. But um, I will say that Mr. Barrett thought quite often in terms of colors, so he may be referencing the colors blue and green by saying diamonds and clubs because that's the colors of a four-color deck for those suits. Uh, let's continue on. There's a mention of waving us back information. So, and then the pack is the pack is that the pack is information. So, um, I guess again that idea of waving back information if you tie it together with the line just preceding that the dead waving us back information which of course could tie in with the idea of the light misted fog and that the pack information so i do wonder if this isn't an idea there of being waved back information from the dead in some ways so perhaps this is a, f a form of an experience, perhaps it's a psychedelic experience, perhaps it's a memory, perhaps it's a dream. All of these things have been referenced prior by Mr. Barrett, and it may be referenced here. Uh, so let's go to the next verse here. Oh, before we move on, I just want to go back and look at the very first line. The pack in formation appears. So there we have alliteration on the P and F sounds, which we have noted before is something that Mr. Barrett likes to do. 
Okay, so let's go to the next line. Bowling bat as a group, so they're batting as a group, which seems to be a recollection of perhaps playing cricket, of course. Uh, bowling and batting is something that happens in, in cricket, so perhaps uh, this is a reference to a wolf pack of kids playing cricket. Uh, there's mention that a leader is seen, and so early. Now, uh, perhaps... Mr. Barrett was recognized as having a, a leadership qualities, even as a youth. I, I don't know. He certainly did have a strong mind, so you would have to think that perhaps people recognized him as a leader early on. That may be a self-reference. I don't know. Uh, packs on their backs. Makes sense if this is a wolf cub pack. They do kind of hike with, with packs on their backs. Why are they fighters? I don't know, the fighters. Next line, that uh, through the misty waving... The pack information, far-reaching waves. Okay, so far-reaching waves, we've, we've discussed the nature of waves and, of course, uh, sound, light, travel in waves, uh, perhaps memories as well. And, of course, the album Echoes deals extensively with the idea of waves and uh, this water kind of feel that is repeatedly addressed by Mr. Barrett in songs like, uh, uh, I'll put the name up here, I can't remember right now. So, uh, Terrapin. So in Terrapin, he specifically mentions uh, being a fish and floating around. On site, uh, um, and then M Mr. Barrett has the last line say, I lay as if in surround. So, so he's laying in surround, in surround what? In surround of memories, of mists of memories, perhaps. The next verse is all is enmeshing and hovering. Milder he gazes, all the animals laying trail. So there's alliteration on the L sound, all animals laying trail. Uh, an interesting combination of words, quite certainly. Uh, beyond the far winds, what are beyond the far winds? Well. Um, beyond the winds is in many uh, cultures that's a reference to the afterlife so uh, again so we had mentioned before of the dead uh, through the light misted fog waving back information here is reference to animals laying trail and the beyond the far winds uh, the next is mild and reflecting electricity eyes. Now there are two lines here that are incredibly interesting. One of them is this, mild the reflecting electricity eyes. I will come back to this later. So for now, just make a note of this line. Uh, I want to point out again the alliteration. So mild reflecting electricity eyes. Notice the, um, the L alliteration and the E's. And uh, I'll come back to the reason why you need to remember electricity eyes in a little bit. The mention of tears now and the life that was ours. So tears, so a sadness and a past life that used to exist. And of course, if this is a reference to Mr. Barrett's uh, youth, then he knows people, of course, that have passed away. And we discussed that in Effervescing Elephant. The next line grows sharper and stronger away and beyond. So uh, growing sharper, of course, would mean sharper, growing sharper to the cut, perhaps, and stronger. Even though it's away and beyond, it's far gone, but it still cuts quite deeply. This may be a reference, of course, to uh, the impact of a loss and Due to context, you'd have to think, of course, that this could be the, the context of loss of a loved one and the most important person who Mr. Barrett uh, lost as a youth is, of course, his father. So this song now, I think you will agree, has enough contextual evidence to perhaps be a recollection of a past life of joys that is dead within Mr. Barrett because of the loss of his father. <clears throat> there are other possible readings, and we'll get into those as well, but uh, it is, in my opinion, quite likely that uh, this song may be about the loss of his father. The next line, short wheeling, a fresh spring. A fresh spring, of course, uh, would be a fresh upwelling of water. 
what could be intended by wheeling? Well, wheeling is quite a, a quite a strange word uh, in that it has many meanings. So I will give you five meanings that I am aware of for the word wheeling. <clears throat> so wheeling can mean the conveyance of water. It can mean the transference of electrical power. And I've chosen to give you those two here because I don't know if they fit. Now we did just mention electricity I, so transfer of electric power maybe, perhaps. Another uh, meaning of the word wheeling is to travel. Another possible meaning of wheeling is dating. So uh, when a first, when it, that, and that is a slang term now. A slang term for early dating or dating as a youth is called wheeling. And uh, we have made note of Mr. Barrett's uh, numerous love songs and love references. So of course this to me is also a possibility. And finally, the last uh, term of wheeling is a form of torture where you break someone's body by, put, by putting them on the wheel. So uh, since this song appears to be about the dead, uh, I would suggest that it is possible that the reference here to wheeling is about the breaking of a body on a wheel, which of course could be a reference to the breaking of a person like his father due to cancer on the wheel of time and uh, uh, on the wheel of nature, the harsh, I guess you could say, uh, mindless or careless whims of nature. Uh, show short wheeling of fresh spring and gripped with blanched bones moaned so there we have more alliteration of bones and moaned and perhaps the connection of words then makes a bit of sense in the idea that this is a, a fresh spring or perhaps a fresh spring of tears that is tied with the idea of blanched bones and moaning tied to the breaking of a body the next uh, line is another incredibly interesting line, Magnesium, Proverbs, and Sobs. Now, some people have chosen to use this line for their own kind of uh, documentaries or whatever, but Magnesium, Proverbs, and Sobs is, a, is an incredibly interesting combination of words. Not just because the Proverbs and Sobs, again, there's our P, V, B alliteration, but also the connection between these, these possible words. Now, of course, magnesium is uh, kind of a, a loaded term. I'll point out that magnesium has a kind of a silver coloration and that it burns quite brightly. It cannot be put out with water, which is interesting, of course, because next to this is the idea of a fresh spring. Well, water doesn't put out burning magnesium. So uh, perhaps this is a reference to the idea of burning pain and sorrow that cannot be uh, cured or put away even with the passing of tears and depression, which is conveyed in the last word, sobs. So why Proverbs? I don't know. Of course, we mentioned that uh, Mr. Barrett's background, his parents at least, had a background with the Quakers, so perhaps this is a reference to Proverbs. As I mentioned, we will discuss Proverbs in a bit. So that is pretty much it for the breakdown of the song. I'm sure there are other interpretations. Uh, some people may think this, this is a song, perhaps, that is just a collection of words that are tied together based solely on sound without meaning and that it is up to interpretation of the listener. I certainly do think uh, there are numerous readings you can have. It, it could simply be intended to be about a wolf pack running around and wreaking havoc, I guess. Maybe that's intended as well. Perhaps this is also conveying the idea of a broken love interest at some time. Uh, you'll have to decide that on your own. I, I won't pretend that I know. I do not know. But I do think it is likely, or at least very possible, that he is discussing of the <clears throat> discussing his own internalization over the struggle with his own uh, father's death. Okay, so uh, it's kind of a depressing topic, and 
let's go ahead and uh, I'll just say that part of the reason why I find Mr. Barrett to be such a, a wonderful person for people to learn about is because uh, I do think that he was trying to beautify his life and beautify uh, his experience and also beautify the world in general for other people even through his own loss which is I think a great kind of an example for people that have uh, suffered or maybe going through something to recognize that there are other people that are also going through that and they have decided to give meaning to that experience and to push on and to continue to make uh, their life meaningful and to uh, deliver a message that is creative and I, I guess you could say something that's healing them in a way and perhaps helping to heal other people. That idea of selflessness and expression within art which is something that I don't think a lot of people give enough value to is incredibly important. So uh, that's part of the reason why Mr. Barrett is, is such an attractive figure to me because I, I think that in, and what I was hoping to do in studying him was to kind of see or learn from him in as much as I could what would be necessary for me to be able to um, perform similar activities. In other words, to beautify my own life and also to kind of go through this experience of self-evaluation and improvement and adapt meaning to what I, I think most people would consider to be negative experiences and turn them into something that is a little bit more positive or building in my life. So uh, perhaps you're doing the same thing. I don't know. Um, I'll leave that up to you. But that's part of the reason why I am quite interested in Mr. Barrett. He seems to have been able to have done that. And, and that's a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice, but he did appear to be able to do that. Now, there are two things that I want to discuss. Now, the first one is, if you remember, the mention of the electric eye. So, why is that important? Hmm. Well, um, because there are two songs that I want to point you to that are made by Pink Floyd and accredited to Roger Waters. They are both from the Final Cut album. Now, the Final Cut um, was released in March of 1983, which is uh, quite some time after Mr. Barrett had already exited the music scene, supposedly. <laughs> so we've already discussed kind of influences of Mr. Barrett and what may or may not uh, have been influenced by him or interacted with him. At any rate, I want to point out two songs to you and we'll go through them and we'll SID score them. <clears throat> and I want to point out some specific things to you. Okay, the first one is called The Final Cut. Now this uh, song uh, was not included in the Wall album for various reasons and whenever I hear that a song is not included in in certain things it makes me a little bit suspicious because of, of course there are there is a history with Mr. Barrett's music of it not being released and songs like Scream Thy Last Scream and uh, Vegetable Man were not included and you listen to those songs and they're good songs so why were they not included well here's a good song called The Final Cut it's a beautiful song and it uh, was not included in the wall so Let's check out the lyrics to The Final Cut, and I'll give a lyric uh, song link here for it if I can find one. Otherwise, if you would, just pull up the lyrics on your phone and follow along. There's a mention of a fish-eyed lens, seeing things through a fish-eyed lens, and tear-stained eyes. Okay, so there's sadness and a fish reference, and seeing th things through a f so very terrapin-like, you know. <clears throat> the next line is that... Uh, this person can barely define the shape of this moment in time. Okay, what what an interesting line there. There is a difficulty in defining time, which, of course, we've noted as another Barrett characteristic. So uh, perhaps I'll give a score. I'll, uh, I Sorry, I, I forgot I was going to give a score. So final cut. 
I'm just going to write this down as we go. So there's a fisheye lens and tear stained eyes. Um, there's a bit of alliteration there, but not too much. Uh, not being able to define the shape of moments in time. I'll give another point, so I'm at two. Not flying high in clear blue skies. Okay, the mention of flying and color reference, that's, that's a four now. Spiraling down to a hole in the ground. So there's our, again, our down, ground, around, alliteration sounds that Mr. Barrett has been using for a very long time or had previously used, so I'm at five points now, in the ground where I hide. And I just, and of course, Mr. Barrett did hide, kind of, for quite some time. So there, I'm at six points already, just on the first verse. And I want to point out, of course, that this idea of hiding down in the ground was also, of course, in Dark Side of the Moon. Um, so you could say that that's an, uh, an Alice in Wonderland reference, or it's just Roger Waters and of course, this song is attributed or credited to Roger Waters. He sings it, and he's he's uh, accredited with writing it. So, if you want to go along with that, uh, you can feel free to do so. Okay, the next line uh, is that if you can negotiate a minefield in a drive, uh, there's a F and a V together with a D kind of alliteration. And you have to beat dogs and then cheat a cold electronic eye. So there is another electronic eye reference, which we just discussed in Wolfpack. And of course, uh, this person apparently is holed up in their house. And, and let's continue on. And if you can make it past, there's a shotgun apparently in the hall. And you have to dial a combination and open a priest hole. And then, of course, a reference to that if you can get in, then they'll tell you what's behind the wall. <laughs> so there's another point. Um, because of the fact that this person seems to be hiding behind a wall. So who is be hiding behind a wall? I mean, do these attributes to use or characteristics seem like Roger Waters? To me, Roger Waters is quite affable. I don't know. Uh, he, he, he talks and gives interviews. Uh, he seems friendly enough. He's been on numerous talk shows. And from the very beginning, when he came to the United States and uh, was on, uh, I think, Dick Clark's show, he was always quite affable. So at any rate, let's continue on. I'm at eight points currently. There's a mention that a kid had a big hallucination being with girls in magazines. And they're wondering if you are sleeping with some newfound faith Hmm, so this apparently is referencing a lost love. I'm not aware of a lost love in Mr. Waters' life. I could be wrong, but I'm not. I am aware of something like that in Mr. Barrett's life, apparently. So I will give another point for that. <clears throat> another question then follows. Could anybody love him? Uh, well, I haven't ever heard Mr. Waters say something like that, but the implication is, of course, uh, Mr. Barrett never did get married, and of course had a number of bad relationships apparently, or relationships that didn't come to fulfillment. Uh, perhaps I shouldn't say bad relationships. I should just say that perhaps they didn't come to fulfillment for some reason, which begs the question, perhaps there's a reason for this question to be justified. If you believe Mr. Barrett had something to do with this, there may be a reason that perhaps Nobody could love him. Perhaps uh, there's kind of a dark side to him. I don't know. Uh, let's continue on. I'm at 10 points currently. Uh, mention of it perhaps just being a crazy dream to be able to find a connection with somebody. Uh, the next question, the next verse is, if this person shows their dark side, will you still be with them tonight? And if they open up their heart and show their weakness, what would you do? Hmm. So uh, I will give another point. I don't know if I should or not. Uh, I'm going to give one point because there are certain things there that for me ring true to Mr. Barrett. And this, that's kind of a subjective kind of a thing. But the idea of this dark side holding a person back and also kind of having this kind of weak side. And there again is a reference to the heart. And of course, we mentioned 
the importance of the heartbeat and the start and end of Dark Side of the Moon and how that ties in with or potentially could tie in with the song uh, with the movie Wizard of Oz. So I'll give another point. I'm, I'm at 11. There follows a question. Uh, would you sell your story to Rolling Stone? And take the children away. Okay, we already have a reference to children. Numerously, uh, numerous potential uh, references to a child or to a daughter or children uh, within Mr. Barrett's music. And perhaps being left alone. And we've discussed that thoroughly in the Tin Man reference. And also in uh, a number of songs including Scream Thy Last Scream and a few others. So we've discussed that at, at ad nauseum about possibly being uh, in, within Mr. Barrett's history. Whispering on the phone in reassurance and then sending this person packing. Now, of course, that may just tie in with the scene uh, that happened in the wall. And of course, in the, in the film, The Wall, the main character, Pink, calls home and uh, is kind of shot down over the phone. So perhaps this could be a reference again. We know something happened to Mr. Barrett during the U.S. tour, uh, or it appears something kind of went very poorly. So uh, that all seems to all kind of be tying together, but I, I'm not going to give a point for that. That's way too much of a grab, but it does seem like it could be. So uh, here's the next few lines. Um, the person thought that they should bear their naked feelings. What that could mean, I don't know, but uh, it apparently relates to the idea of being honest. There are numerous references within Mr. Barrett's music about being honest, including I never lied to you. I'll give another point for that. That's 13. So not lying, telling people the truth, and then not being accepted, or the fear of that, for whatever reason. The next line is that they thought they should tear the curtain down. So, uh, of course, tearing the curtain down is something that happens within Wizard of Oz at the end of the movie when the wizard is revealed to just be a normal guy. And perhaps Mr. Burt felt if he had something to do with these lines that uh, he had to have a wall or a curtain up to be more than who he just was because that wasn't good enough. It's hard to say. I'll give one more point for that. I'm at 14. The next few lines are, of course, quite distressing. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the person held a blade in trembling hands, prepared to make it, but. Now, I've also seen that that uh, lyric or line could be prepared to naked flesh, uh, but uh, could be wrong. And then the phone rang, and they didn't have the nerve to make the final cut. So there we have a possible reference to cutting oneself, which is, of course, <clears throat> what a final cut could be. As a metaphor. So who is dealing with that level of depression? Uh, I don't know. It's hard to say. Perhaps other people have gone through it. Perhaps it's just an allegory. Perhaps it's just a story. And it doesn't directly tie in with anyone personally. At any rate, I have a final score of final uh, on Final Cut of 15 points, which is quite large. And does tie in with the electronic eye or the electric eye that we just called out in Wolfpack. Now there is another song that I would like to point you to from this same album. And that song is called The Gunner's Dream. So let's do another score for The Gunner's Dream. <clears throat> so I'll give you a link to The Gunner's Dream. Hopefully uh, I can find a lyric version, I don't know. Starts off with the idea of floating down through clouds. So there again, there's a cloud reference in floating or flying. Memories coming to this person. So there's another point, I'm at two points. Uh, there's a mention between the space and the heavens in the corner of a field. They had a dream So there's a dream reference. I'm at three Notice the two lines after this goodbye Max and goodbye Ma I just want to point out that Max is Mr. Barrett's father's name. His his father was named Max Barrett uh, Now you could say well up to this point in time. He has not used anyone's real name and I will say, yes, that's very true. It, it does, if this is Mr. Barrett, and these are the lyrics of Mr. Barrett, he does not tend to use people's real names. But I will point out that when you're referencing love interests and other things 
if they are people that are still alive or associated with other people that may take offense or be hurt by the lyrics, it would make sense to disguise the names. In this case, if this song is written by Mr. Barrett about his own father, the only person who would be hurt by this song would be him. So in that case, he would not need to disguise the name of his own father. And of course, his father couldn't be hurt by it either since his father was gone. And in many ways, this song is paying reference to his father or potentially doing so. So after uh, there's a mention that after the service, he'd be walking slowly to the car and the silver in her hair is shining in the cold November air. Okay, so there's quite a few things there. So you could take the service to mean military service, of course, or after the service, in other words, the service of the, funer the funerary services. There's a mention of November, and of course, the question you're going to ask is, when did Max pass away? Mr. Uh, Max Barrett passed away December 11th, 1961. So it was in December, not November. Take from that, what you will, but at any rate, it would be cold winter air. Now, there is no mention, of course, uh, of a Max, only a her. So the silver in her hair is shining. And you hear a tolling bell. We've discussed the tolling bell uh, that is on Dark Side of the Moon repeatedly. The, the mention of a tolling bell, who for whom does the bell toll for you? Because we are all connected. So uh, you touch the silk in your lapel and the teardrops rise and you take her frail hand and hold on to the dream. So her, who's her? Uh, her is Ma. So this very likely, if written by Mr. Barrett, could be a reference to a memory of his father's passing in service and being with his own mother. So I'm at five points now for Gunner's Dream for Sid score. Uh, the song continues on with a place to stay and enough to eat and old heroes uh, shuffling down the streets you don't have to worry about you can speak out loud doubts and fears nobody disappears no standard issue is kicking in your door uh these these lyrics are all very simple which are very water roger waters like i will just kind of point out and it's also very well structured and formed to time, which is something that Mr. Barrett doesn't traditionally like to do, but perhaps is happening here. Uh, you can relax on both sides of the tracks. We've mentioned the rail reference previously in Mr. Barrett's music. That's another point. There's a statement that maniacs won't blow up holes in bandsmen and people follow the law and nobody's killing children anymore. Uh, so I'm at six points so far. I don't see too much that uh, is poetically interesting other than the bit about uh, Max and Ma and the things being in line kind of with Mr. Barrett's, uh, Mr. Barrett's background. So let's continue on. The verse then is a mention of night after night and around his brain. This person's dream is driving me or the writers uh, insane. And the gunner is sleeping in some foreign field. And we should take heed of the dream. Now, of course, uh, Mr. Barrett's father was not, not buried in some foreign field. Uh, he, he was buried in England. So I'm not entirely certain what that could be. Now, of course, Mr. Waters' father may have been buried in a foreign field. He was killed during the war. So... Uh, overseas, I believe, in France. So uh, perhaps that's a reference to uh, Roger Waters' father, in which case you'd have to say, well, that's that's evidence that Mr. Waters did indeed write this song. Why he would choose to use the name Max, I don't know. Perhaps, as we have, have said before, perhaps the two men may even have been working together to put together lyrics and uh, just chose only to give credit to Mr. Waters, perhaps by design. Hard to say. At any rate, I have a score of six on The Gunner's Dream. And that's pretty much all I wanted to break down with those two songs, uh, just to give some kind of a delineation to a relation with the song The Wolf Pack. Now, the second bit of Wolf Pack 
that is very interesting is, uh, or the second line that we mentioned was magnesium, proverbs, and sobs. So if you actually examine Proverbs, which is, of course, one of the books of the Bible, and we've before mentioned uh, some aspects of Mr. Barrett that are tied to um, Christianity, or, or could be tied to Christianity, I don't know. I'm looking through, this book is a New American Bible, it's a new Catholic translation, this was a gift to me from somebody at some point in time. I've been around Catholics a lot, so I, I don't know who gave this to me, but uh, I'm not Catholic, I guess, uh, but this book is, and it has quite a few explanations to it, so for whatever reason I, I have it, and I don't know if it matters necessarily because uh, this is all Old Testament stuff anyway, so uh, at any rate, let's run through Proverbs and we'll see if we can find anything that perhaps was of interest to Mr. Barrett. Now there are breakdowns of the various, I don't know what you call it, sections by chapter of Proverbs. They are not linear and uh, they do seem to have been written with, there, there are connections between certain chapters but not between others for whatever reason. I don't know why that is the case but uh, that certainly is the case. So there are different sections here and uh, a suggested division which follows as this. And these are the basic topics that are covered within Proverbs. An introduction on the value of wisdom, so the importance of wisdom. First collection of Proverbs of Solomon is the second bit. The third bit is sayings of the wise. The fourth is other sayings of the wise. Uh, perhaps uh, I should give the chapters that are involved. I'll just put those on the screen as I run through these. The fifth collection is kind of a second collection of the Proverbs of Solomon. The sixth collection are the words of Agur. I don't know who that is. The seventh is numerical Proverbs. The eighth is words of Lemuel. And ninth is the ideal wife. Oh, quite interesting. The ideal wife. Uh, so perhaps if you think that's what Proverbs is about and you think it's about a relation with a lady, then there's a little bit more. Um, ammo for that argument. So I'm just going to read through some starred sections here that I think relay to topics that Mr. Barrett uh, may have been interested in as far as I can tell from his work. And uh, you decide if you think they're applicable or not, but uh, I'll run through them. So chapter one, um, I don't know what this is, second, I don't know, I don't know what they call these. I'm just going to call it out uh, by chapter, number, and then the secondary number. I don't know what they call that. So chapter 1, I'll call it verse 2. Uh, that men may appreciate wisdom and discipline, may understand words of intelligence, may receive training in wise conduct in what is right, just, and honest. That resourcefulness may be imparted to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man, by hearing them, will advance in learning. An intelligent, an intelligent man will gain sound guidance that he may comprehend proverb and parable. The words of the wise and their riddles. Okay, now we have recognized the ability of Mr. Barrett to speak in riddles, I guess you could say, which is um, formed perhaps as a youth and, and the learning of Christ, of course, Christ often spoke in riddles. So uh, perhaps that is something that is, is uh, consistent with his youth and that would explain why magnesium proverbs and sobs. Uh, perhaps Mr. Barrett began considering the nature of proverbs, perhaps wisdom and understanding were things that were valuable to him and so he was trying to work through these for quite some time, including in his youth. And of course losing a man uh, like his father that was well respected and apparently quite intelligent and also quite uh, selfless would cause a young man to look outside then for guidance in many ways. So perhaps that's the reason why Mr. Barrett would have been interested in Proverbs. I don't know. Uh, chapter 1, I'm just going to call it line but line. So line 13, all kinds of precious wealth shall we gain, we shall Fill our houses with booty. Cast in your lot with us. We shall have one purse. Okay. Uh, let's go back up. 
<clears throat> now this is a warning against money. So I'm going to go to uh, line 10, actually. Chapter 1, line 10. My son, should, should sinners entice you and say, come along with us, let us lie in wait for the honest man. Let us unprovoked set a trap for the, un for the innocent. Let us swallow them up as the netherworld does alive. In the prime of life, like those who go down to the pit, all kinds of precious wealth shall we gain, and shall we fill our houses with booty. Um, my son, walk not in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their path. From their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed blood. So, in other words, stay away from people that are covetous and just want to gain through, uh, through theft and uh, stealing. Um... <clears throat> Here's chapter 2, which is about the blessing of wisdom. Turning your ear to wisdom, uh, line 2, I'll start there. Turning your ear to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call to intelligence, to understanding, raise your voice. If you seek her like silver and like hidden treasures, treasures, search her out. Then will you understand the fear of the Lord, the knowledge of God will find you will find. There is a reference to the color silver, and of course... Uh, we mentioned before the, the Scarlet Eagle reigning silver on the people lyric of Mr. Barrett. Here again is the idea of silver, which is tied to intelligence, understanding, and wisdom. Uh, same chapter 2, line 18. Uh, saving you from the wife of another, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the pact with her God. Mm, that's a weird one. Isn't that kind of interesting? There have been numerous uh, references to companions of youth and also uh, a pact, perhaps, and also the idea of hiding one's hands because they're not like you, which we have discussed before as well. Now, <clears throat> uh, I, I just want to point out really quickly that Proverbs is, is, of course, written mainly by men, and in many ways it is quite misogynistic. And in its expression of the ideas of the ideal wife, that is a timed thing. Uh, perhaps in some ways it holds true for some people, though I will mention that to the modern person, the ideals that are expressed here may not be compatible with modern life. Okay, let's at any rate, let's continue on. So chapter 3, line 13, happy the man who finds wisdom. The man who gains understanding for her profit is better than profit in silver and better than gold is her revenue. She is more precious than corals and none of your choice possessions can compare with her. So there, <clears throat> there is a mention of the incredible value of wisdom. Um, chapter 6, line 16, there are six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet that run swiftly to evil, the false witness who utters lies, and he who sows, sows discord among brothers. So, uh, I guess those are the seven deadly sins, I don't know. But I just want to point out that in many ways, Mr. Barrett goes out of his way to discuss certain things, such as, I never lied to you. And uh, being honest in the importance of those things. <sighs> Let's continue on. Uh, this is chapter 6, line 26. For the price of a loose woman may be scarcely a loaf of bread, but if she is married, she is a trap for your precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his garments not burned? Or can a man walk on live coals and his feet not be scorched? So with him who goes in to his neighbor's wife, none who touches her shall go unpunished. Uh, well, there's the idea within Proverbs of burning and... Of course, we just mentioned uh, Magnesium Proverbs. So if you are of the mindset that Magnesium Proverbs may be a reference to the, the quality of Magnesium to burn, then perhaps there is a reference as to why. Perhaps it is a reference to the idea of uh, burning 
with adultery. And uh, although they do say female here, I just want to point out, of course, that uh, the same is true for men, that it is, uh, in many cases, uh, a, an entirely unsatisfactory relation for various reasons, including the impact to families. <clears throat> Chapter 12, line 1, He who loves correction loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. <laughs> uh, that doesn't really tie in much with Mr. Barrett. I just like that one, so I wanted to read it. There are really wonderful things here in Proverbs, in my opinion, so I'm, I'm just throwing some of them at you. Chapter 14, line 12, The senseless man... Oh no, chapter 15, line 12, sorry. Senseless man loves not to be reproved. To wise men he will not go. Uh, now there are aspects of Mr. Barrett that apparently didn't like to be corrected, and he was quite willful. So perhaps that's something to take from this. I, I don't know. It's up to you. You'll have to decide. Let's keep let's keep going. There is uh, quite a few of these, I suppose. <clears throat> I'm looking at chapter 20, uh, line 3. It is honorable for a man to shun strife while every fool starts a quarrel. Line 8 through 9. A king seated on the throne of judgment dispels all evil with his glance. Who can say... I have made my heart clean. I am cleansed of my sin. Varying weights, varying measures are both an abomination to a Lord. Now, we've mentioned uh, the many references to king and queen within Mr. Barrett's uh, uh, lyrics. And I just want to point out that Proverbs do tie in quite a bit with Solomon, who was uh, a king of sorts, of course, uh, considered to be very wise and an ideal um, for his time. Uh, now, one of the things I should point out, of course, is that uh, I believe David and Solomon had had extensive concubine groups, so it's a little bit odd to think that in modern to the modern person, the idea of having a uh, marriage that is, of course, um, monogamous would be quite uh, different than the lives that were being led by David and Solomon. And perhaps for whatever reason, that's something to take into consideration. But it's a little bit uh, upsetting to me to think that uh, these people are giving advice on women when they are basically, uh, they, are, they are not devoted to a single woman. So <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's a little bit odd to think someone would be taking advice from these men that have like a hundred wives, whatever you want to call that, and pretending that uh, a person is capable of caring for them. It's just odd to think that someone who has uh, so many relationships with so many women would have a, have a delineation between a marriage. In, in that case... Simply put, this would be treating women as, only as property. In other words, you shouldn't commit adultery because it's hurting hearts or hurting families. You should avoid committing adultery because it's property that a, a woman is property that belongs to other people. And you're violating that relationship within society, which is extremely strange to me to think that people would think that way. It is in many ways... Um, kind of a restrictive and loveless and misogynistic way of viewing things. So uh, there are, as we'll find out with Nietzsche later, things that I think you should, things that I will take from these and things that I will discard as being not useful to me. So in many ways, uh, I feel that many of these proverbs uh, contain ideas that People would some people would call holy, and I will say that in some ways I consider them to be wholly wrong. <laughs> at any rate, let's continue. Chapter 23, line 1. When you sit down to dine with the ruler, keep in mind who is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you have a ravenous appetite. 
Do, do, not, des do not desire his delicacies. They are deceitful food. In other words, do not be a wolf. <laughs> do not be ravenous. Because uh, a ruler has many wonderful things that they can give to you. But uh, you won't gain wisdom in the consumption of those things. Uh, chapter 28, line 15, like a roaring lion or a ravenous bear is a wicked ruler over a poor people. This, this one doesn't have anything to do with Mr. Barrett. I'm just, I've just been thinking on this lately. The idea that so many people now are poor or indebted. And it seems to capture an idea here that is quite applicable even to the modern world. Like a roaring lion or a ravenous bear is a wicked ruler over a poor people. Why so? Well, because poor people have no recourse. They are not able to withstand the the might and power of a ravenous uh, bear or a roaring lion because they do not have access to money, and money is associated, of course, with power. Not just in the ability to buy weapons, etc., but also, uh, say, for example, if you were indebted to another person, could you be honest with them? That's a very difficult thing to do. So it steals away the power of your words when you are when you are poor. <sighs> Here now is the ideal wife. Uh, to finish this on kind of a positive knife, a uh, positive, on a positive vibe. Let's look then. Chapter thirty-one, line ten. When one finds a worthy wife, her value is far beyond pearls. Her husband, entrusting his heart to her, has an unfailing prize. She brings him good and not evil all the days of her life. Uh, 26. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and on her tongue is kindly counsel. She watches the conduct of her household and eats not her food in idleness. Her children rise up and praise her. Her husband too extols her. Many are the women of proven worth, but you have excelled them all. So, <clears throat> now as I just mentioned, of course, uh, uh, Solomon and David were polygamists. So, the idea that they would entrust their heart to her, and that this wife would be an unfailing prize, is a little bit disingenuous in my opinion. Because you can't do that if you're doing that a hundred times. Just my opinion. But... Certainly, the intent there, and this is, of course, a traditional relationship, uh, um, uh, heterosexual, male-female marriage, traditional, but I would argue that that is true with, with any relationship, that if, if you are able to find whoever this person is and you are able to find a person that is worthy, uh, worthy of your attention, worthy of your affection, then that person is worth everything that you possess because what they can give you is much more than anything that this earth has to offer. So <clears throat> that's quite wise advice. And I believe it was my mother who mentioned to me that the most important decision a person ever makes is who they will marry. And I think that was, that was quite possibly the uh, best advice that my mother ever gave to me. So, let's finish up then with an easy topic, Frederick Nietzsche. And this is, well, this is a really long discussion, I'm sorry. Frederick Nietzsche, uh, should I continue on? Or should we save Frederick Nietzsche for another day? I think we'll save Frederick Nietzsche for another day, I'm tired. <laughs> and we can... We can run through Friedrich Nietzsche some other day. We're already over an hour into this, and I'm sure I've kind of strained your patience. And perhaps uh, that's a good place to end. So, how can I end this end this discussion? Okay, let's discuss the song that started the whole talk. Wolf Pack. What is a wolf? A wolf is, is hungry. A wolf, as we mentioned, is a symbol of strength. A wolf is part of a family. A wolf is part of a group. A wolf possesses valor. It's able to team up with other people and accomplish things. So I do wonder if Mr. Barrett wasn't considering all those aspects 
and in some ways displaying strength and valor and creating a song like this that's trying to tie together so many ideas. Uh, perhaps he was, perhaps he wasn't. Uh, that's totally up to you and whatever you believe. But I will say this. I do strongly feel that it's not easy to put your heart out there and as we mentioned in the song bury your naked feelings and tear the curtain down and show people who you really are uh, it's a very difficult thing to do and it's a very honest thing to do it's a very beautiful thing to do and hopefully when we do that people will accept us for who we are but we always run the risk of people not being able to accept us for who we are and I will say that uh, that's unfortunate and many people are f are left kind of feeling alone but I I don't think anymore that that anyone is alone there always are people out there that are feeling the same way and that have gone through similar kind of difficulties in life and the expression of art and the expression within music the expression within songs like this of uh, difficulty in life they form a form of community amongst people that have had similar experiences. And those experiences are experiences that if we share and if we acknowledge our own shortcomings and vulnerabilities, uh, help to strengthen one another. And so for that reason, I do think this song really is a wonderful song that celebrates uh, Mr. Barrett's life. and. Hopefully this discussion and the considerations of the lyrics and Mr. Barrett's life is something that uh, gives extra insight into the song itself, but also gives a, a bit of extra satisfaction and gives you kind of a resolution as it has to me. It's given me kind of a resolution that I'm going to uh, utilize the experiences of my life, even if they were negative, to build positive things, to continue to beautify my own life and to help other people in an indirect way, if that's how I resolve to do it, or in a more direct way. And as I have put together this series and decided that uh, quite some time ago that this would be something that would... Um, hopefully give value to myself and to other people. Perhaps that's something that also, um, if you're listening to this and considering and considering uh, this discussion, then perhaps you'll decide to do the same. I don't know. That's up to you. So that's it for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't uh, subscribed, I'll suggest that you uh, go ahead and do so. If you like these discussions and you like Mr. discussions of uh, Mr. Barrett's work and possible interpretations of his work, and that's all for today.